two plaques, both in South London, commemorate the remarkable life of George Arthur Roberts. The first is a Southwark Heritage Association blue plaque on the outside of the Lewis Trust buildings in Warner Road, Camberwell, where George lived from 1923 until his death in 1970. The other is a red plaque on New Cross Fire Station, where George was stationed during the Second World War. This plaque was unveiled by the London Fire Brigade on the 15th of April 2018. As both plaques tell, George was a soldier in the First World War, a firefighter in the Second World War, and an important figure in the local community. He campaigned for improved rights and higher pensions for ex-servicemen, and Roberts was a founder member of the League of Coloured Peoples, one of the first organisations to represent Britain's black community. George was born in Trinidad. Stephen Bourne is a historian who studied the experiences of black Britons in both world wars. I asked him what we knew of George's early life. We don't know too much um, about George's early life at all. Uh, he, other than when he was a young man and the First World War broke out, he wanted to join up and join the British Army, which he did, travelled from Trinidad to England. He had married and, and, and had a family in Trinidad before the First World War, but he was one of those black men from the Caribbean, from what was a colony, a British colony, when we had the empire, who wanted an adventure, wanted to get out of the repressive colony. And the war was a sort of elevation in some respects, as awful as it was, for, for men like George to escape from that repressive sort of background. Britain had declared war on Germany and entered what we now know as the First World War on the 4th of August 1914, that is, two days after George's 23rd birthday. Across Britain and the Empire, men rushed to enlist. In another video, we saw that in the first five weeks of the war, almost half a million men in Britain and nearly 70,000 in London joined up to fight. Many young men like George saw the war as an opportunity for adventure, Certainly, it gave them the chance to see some of the world. Unfortunately, the British Army's records do not shed as much light on the service records of these men as we might hope or expect. At the time, many forms were completed in a hurry, and it is well known that recruits were not always completely truthful on their attestations. Perhaps one quarter of those who enlisted in one South London regiment, for example, lied about their age, telling the recruiting sergeants that they were 19 years old and thus old enough to fight, when they were often just 16 or 17. Worse, less than half the records we had actually survive. The rest were destroyed in the Blitz of London in the Second World War. George's records, or at least what survives of them, tell us that he enlisted in the first in the British West Indies Regiment before transferring to the Middlesex Regiment. Stephen Bourne again. Again, because there's no evidence written down or from him of, of his war service and experiences, but we do know the battles he was in and that uh, he was in the Battle of the Somme and other sort of famous battles and was wounded. But he was known to be... Um, someone who was very... Because of his height, he was very tall, over, well over six foot. And he was the one that was well known in the army, well, particularly in his regiment and other regiments, for throwing the German bombs back over the German line. And I think that's quite an extraordinary, I mean, a very crazy thing to do, very brave thing to do. He was so tall he would pick the, the shell up when it landed and just throw it back at the Germans. So, and he, there are a couple of one or two newspaper cuttings that attest to this. But unfortunately, with the passage of time and people not engaging with people like George in previous decades, the, the story is just not highlighted, which is why I had great difficulty finding information on him originally. We do not know how many black soldiers ever joined the British Army. 
At the time, the race or ethnicity of applicants was not recorded. What we do know is that after the war, many of those who had enlisted from Britain's empire and colonies stayed in Britain. George was one of them, settling first in Peckham and then Camberwell, where he earned a living working as an electrician. He was passionate about the plight of his fellow ex-servicemen, and he spent many years campaigning with the National Federation of Discharged and Demobilised Sailors and Soldiers. George was an extraordinary man because he... Clearly his war service meant a lot to him, and the comrades that he made friends with during the First World War meant a lot to him because as soon as the British Legion was founded in, I think it was around 1920-21, he started to get involved. He was he was the founder of the Camberwell branch of the British Legion. I haven't been able to date the next bit of information, unfortunately, but sometime in the 1920s, he was one of the ex-soldiers, ex-servicemen who led a demonstration to, to Westminster, to the Houses of Parliament. And they got as far, and then it was to campaign for better treatment of ex-servicemen, particularly those who had been wounded in the First World War and were not being financially supported or supported in any way. There were thousands of them, and he led a demonstration, and many, many ex-servicemen uh, came on this march. And the march got as far as Westminster Bridge, and then the police on the instructions of, of, of the government at the time, um, barred them uh, from crossing the bridge to the Houses of Parliament. And there was a, a battle. It was called the Battle of Westminster Bridge. And in fact, George wrote at length about this many years later in the 1960s in a kind of brochure that the, for some commemoration of the British Legion that acknowledge that part of the history and it, it's in his photos there in the brochure as well with him te- relating this extraordinary story. As well as his involvement with the Royal British Legion, George was also a founder member of the League of Coloured Peoples in 1931 with Dr Harold Moody. This was a British civil rights organisation that sought to promote and protect the social, educational, economic and political interests of its members and to raise awareness of the welfare of black people across the world. It also wanted to improve relations between races and to cooperate with similar civil rights organisations. In the 1930s, for example, it opposed the persecution of Jews in Germany. Well, I, I, I would imagine George's paths would have crossed with Dr Howard Moody, the Jamaican doctor, because they lived nearby. Um, but in 1931 when Dr. Howard Moody founded the League of Coloured Peoples, and it was based at that time in in Dr. Moody's home in Queens Road, Peckham, where he had his doctor's surgery as well. And George was also a founder member, along with other uh, black men and women who were in Britain at that time. Who, And it was the League of Coloured Peoples was one of the first black-led organisations to try and take care of the needs of Britain's black community. And that carried on right through the war and after the war. And then after Dr Moody died, sadly, in 1947, the League didn't really survive much longer, which is kind of sad when you think that the year after Dr Moody died, 1948, is Windrush, that whole new generation of people come from Africa and the Caribbean to these shores and they needed an organisation like the League of Coloured Peoples, but there was no one of Dr Moody's stature and importance to carry on that work, and it just uh, faded away in the early 1950s. But George was there from the beginning right to the end. When the Second World War broke out in 1939, George was too old to enlist, but he evidently still wanted to do his bit. In fact, in 1938... Before the outbreak of the war, he had signed up with the Auxiliary Fire Service and George served as a firefighter throughout the war. This was dangerous work. Over the course of the Second World War, 327 London firemen were killed and thousands were injured as they battled to save the lives of their fellow citizens. Many firefighters like George would have served in the First World War 
and their experiences of remaining calm amidst noise, confusion and danger would have stood them in good stead. In 1943, George was made section leader at New Cross Fire Station, and one year later, George's bravery and service were given official recognition, as Stephen Bourne can explain. George's war service was formally recognised by Buckingham Palace when he was awarded the British Empire Medal uh, in 1944-45. And he was undoubtedly a very patriotic man, um, very loyal to king and country, and would probably have been extremely proud of that honour. Um, so he he did at least get some sort of formal recognition <laughs> before he gets lost in time, and, and sadly the story isn't recorded in the history books or World War II books or home front books, which is a great, great, great shame, but good to know that he got some sort of formal rec- recognition at the time. Those men who had served in the First World War, like George, must also have been particularly aware of the psychological challenge of service in these conditions. Perhaps that is one reason why George was instrumental in the establishment of discussion groups within the fire service. Certainly through these groups, George crossed paths with some very famous people indeed. One of the most extraordinary things that George did and pioneered in the fire service during the London Blitz was the discussion groups. And what happened was, during the London Blitz, firemen would be at their fire stations across London and waiting for the air raid siren to go to get out to save people's lives, put out fires. And But they spent many, many hours on duty doing nothing, getting probably agitated, irritated, whatever. So George founded the discussion groups, And there are photographs of him. I found one in a book, a lovely colour portrait that was taken by John Hind, famous colour photographer of the time who did a lot of war photographs. And through those discussion groups that George pioneered, he met some of the literary people of the time, Stephen Spender, the poet, the writer who was in um, the fire service, Norman Heppel, who was a war artist, who then painted George's portrait in 1941, a stunning portrait that I knew about because somebody told me about it many years ago, but I could not find any evidence of it. And she told me, this friend of mine, that, oh, I saw it in the book in the War Museum, but that's as much as she could tell me. And then 20 years later, I found it. In it's a lovely pamphlet that I found on eBay in America called Jim Brady, The Story of Britain's Firemen. And it's illustrated with paintings by firemen artists, including Norman Heppel. It was published during the war, and it's like a catalogue of paintings that were done of firemen and women during the Second World War. Um, and George's portrait is there, so I found it. In 1916... George was given special leave to return to Trinidad to recruit more volunteers. He must have been a persuasive man, for his speeches are said to have helped recruit more than 250 men. In 1947, he appeared on the BBC's Calling the West Indies radio programme. Calling the West Indies aimed to provide West Indian servicemen and women in Britain with an opportunity to broadcast messages to their loved ones in the Caribbean. Some 10 or 20,000 West Indians volunteered for service in the Allied armies in the Second World War. Of course, there were also many black soldiers who were not necessarily West Indian. We might take the example of George's two sons, both of whom were born in London and both of whom saw active service in the Second World War. George had two sons and they both served in the army in the Second World War. Cyril was sadly captured at Dunkirk, or just outside Dunkirk, in in the evacuation of 1940 and became a prisoner of war in Germany for almost the whole duration of the war. He was repatriated in 1944, so he was away for a very long time. And Victor served 
in the army as well and was at D-Day, the D-Day landings. And very important to know this because, and this is one of my big criticisms of British filmmakers, that no matter how much people like George Roberts and his sons served in the Second World War, they're never represented, hardly ever represented in British cinema about the Second World War. And it, it, it's a great shame because I think younger generations will just see a sea of white faces in the in these films, and and it, it, it's which historically is not a hundred percent accurate. Unfortunately, the recording of George's appearance on Calling the West Indies does not survive, but a transcript does, and we know that in the program George reflected on his life in London. Asked if he would ever consider returning to Trinidad, he replied, My mind has drifted to the West Indies many times, but I always find a reasonable ground for deciding to stay put. And put in London he stayed until on the 8th of January 1970, George died of a heart attack. For some 40 or so years, there was little celebration or even recognition of this Londoner's remarkable life. That has begun to change in the last 10 years or so. Stephen Bourne wrote about George's life in his book, Black Poppies, which was first published in 2014. And Stephen then led a campaign to recognise George's distinguished public service. Two years later, following an overwhelming public vote, a Southwark Heritage blue plaque was put up in George's honour. His great-granddaughter, Samantha Hardin, organised the unveiling ceremony, which was very well attended indeed. The publicity generated by the book campaign, vote and ceremony came to the attention of some members of the London Fire Brigade. And two years later, George was remembered on a red plaque at New Cross Fire Station too. Since then, George and Samantha have featured in an advert for Ancestry.com and George was even mentioned by the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in a specially recorded video address. There is also a website run by Samantha Hardin which remembers and celebrates George's life and legacy. And Stephen Bourne has written about George's Second World War service in his new book, Under Fire, Black Britain in Wartime, 1939-45. It's good to see George getting the recognition he deserves. <laughs> 